Today, I'm revealing the nine critical tests that can help safeguard your longevity. Here's the challenge. Some of the most common blood tests aren't telling you the whole story. And in some cases, they may overlook the earliest warning signs of disease. These standard labs might be missing key information that could tell you, number one, if you're truly set up to live well long-term. Number two, whether you have early markers for future health complications. Number three, you get your blood work and lab tests back from your doctor and everything looks normal. Unfortunately, normal doesn't always mean optimal. In fact, these standard labs might be missing key information that could tell you, number one, if you're truly set up to live well long-term. Number two, whether you have early markers for future health complications. Number three, if there are easy changes you could make to boost your energy, peace, and joy every day. Here's the challenge. Some of the most common blood tests aren't telling you the whole story. And in some cases, they may overlook the earliest warning signs of disease. I recently saw a patient in his 30s who came to me after being told by his primary care doctor at the University of Pennsylvania that his labs were completely normal. He felt relieved, like he'd gotten a clean bill of health. But when I looked more carefully, I saw a very different story. His blood work showed clear signs of pre-diabetes. Here's the thing. There is nothing pre about prediabetes. People with prediabetes already have insulin resistance, which means their cells are numb to insulin. First, the insulin goes up, and then over the years, the glucose starts to go up, like it did in this guy with a fasting glucose of 103 milligrams per deciliter. That insulin resistance drives excess inflammation, it damages blood vessels, and it sets the stage for disease. Patients with prediabetes are four times more likely to die of heart disease. Insulin resistance is the real problem, and that's where our focus should be as doctors and as citizen scientists when we look at labs. We should not wait until diabetes arrives with flashing lights and a diagnosis code before we take action. The warning signs show up years before, as they did in this man's labs, but no one had told him. That's the tragedy and the opportunity. By paying attention to these early markers, we can change the story before it's too late. I'm Dr. Sarah Zoll, a Harvard MIT educated physician, New York Times bestselling author, and recognized leader in longevity medicine. Over 30 years in practice, I've guided hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, collaborated with world-renowned physicians, and analyzed cutting-edge research to identify what truly impacts your long-term health. Today, I'm revealing the nine critical tests that can help safeguard your longevity. The first scenario is everything looks normal. You probably have had this frustration. You might be asking yourself, why do I feel tired, but my labs are fine? What's the difference between normal and optimal? Why won't my doctor investigate further when I still have symptoms? Or maybe you've asked, which vitamin deficiencies are the most common and do I have them? So before I jump into answering these questions, in this scenario, we're going to talk about two key measurements, vitamin D3 and ferritin. So first, why do I feel tired, but my labs are fine? Here's the dirty little secret about most lab testing. It's designed to catch disease, not dysfunction. That means you can feel wiped out, foggy, or moody, but your labs may come back stamped normal. In reality, those tests are sometimes blind to the early warning signs of hormonal imbalance and burnout, what I call the gray zone, before disease shows up. And doctors are even more blind they just aren't trained to be thinking about the changes that occur before disease sets in and how to test for them. What's the difference between normal and optimal? Normal means you fall somewhere in the herd of people who are tested, which is not a high bar. Think about it. Normal includes the exhausted, the inflamed, the unwell. Optimal is a different conversation. It's where your vitamin D is high enough to support your immune system and your mood or your thyroid is tuned up so that you feel sharp, calm, and energized. Normal helps you survive, whereas optimal helps you thrive. So you might also be wondering, why isn't my doctor 
investigating further when I still have symptoms. The problem here is that most doctors are trained to look for disease. And if they don't see it, they stop there. They're not usually taught to chase down symptoms that live in that gray zone of suboptimal health. So when you say, doc, I still feel tired. I still can't sleep. My hair is falling out. They may shrug because the lab work doesn't scream pathology. But this is exactly where we need better medicine. We need to bridge the gap between labs and your lived experience. You may also wonder which vitamin deficiencies are the most common. So when patients come to me saying, I feel awful, but everything looks fine, I always check vitamin D. I also look at ferritin for iron storage, and I look at a few other cofactors. So sometimes your ferritin or your vitamin D are low enough to make you feel tired or foggy, but not low enough to ring the alarm bells in the traditional medical system. And the fix can be surprisingly simple once you actually measure them. So here's what I want you to know about labs. They can look normal on paper, but you can still feel like something is off. Tired, foggy, maybe even anxious. Two of the sneakiest culprits are vitamin D3 and ferritin. Ferritin is the protein that's involved in storing your iron. Low vitamin D3 can tank your immune system, your mood, even your hormones. It can be linked to leaky gut. Vitamin D3 is less of a vitamin and more of a hormone that is misnamed as a vitamin. It regulates over 200 genes. It's deeply intertwined with your immune function, your bone density, your mood, and even your hormonal balance. Low ferritin can masquerade as depression, brain fog, or just that feeling of running on fumes. Both are common, especially in women. I see them most commonly in hormonal transitions. And both are often missed if you don't specifically measure them. That's why if you don't feel normal, but your doctor says your labs are fine, it's time to ask for these markers, vitamin D3 and ferritin. They may be the missing piece of your energy and resilience puzzle. Now, the second scenario is my hormones are out of balance. This creates a dilemma and it might make you wonder which hormone should I be testing in my 30s, my 40s, my 50s? How does this differ for men versus women? Why does my doctor only test my thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH for thyroid? So here we're going to talk about five different tests, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, and anti-mullerian hormone. In your 30s, you want a baseline. You want to know what your estrogen is, your estradiol, your progesterone, your free and total testosterone. You also want to check your thyroid function beyond just TSH including free T3, free T4, and thyroid antibodies. Now, I sometimes check anti-mullerian hormone if you want a sense of your ovarian reserve, but context is really important with AMH. These tests can help you see early shifts before perimenopause sneaks up. In your 40s, things get trickier. Progesterone often starts to decline first, which is why sleep disruption, anxiety, premenstrual syndrome can skyrocket. That's when you want to see your progesterone level, sometimes your estradiol, your thyroid function. But with thyroid function, you want to see that free T3, not just the TSH. I'll say that again, free T3, because your thyroid needs to be assessed where the action happens, which is at the tissue level. In your 50s, estrogen and progesterone usually drop significantly and testosterone might be flatlining too, although that can happen earlier depending on how much stress you're under. So in your 50s, that's when checking your estrogen, estradiol, testosterone, and even bone density becomes crucial. I also keep an eye on ferritin and vitamin D3 at every stage because they color the whole picture. Now, when you look at men versus women, a lot of these principles overlap but the emphasis is different. Men benefit from knowing they're free in total testosterone as early as their 20s. Women, on the other hand, need more granular testing, especially around estrogen, progesterone, and thyroid, 
because they have so many cyclical changes. What makes me crazy is that most guidelines were written with male physiology in mind. Linear, stable, predictable. Female physiology is cyclical, dynamic, and much more complex. That's why we need a different lens. And that's why women are often told, your labs are fine, when what their doctor actually means is, we didn't look far enough. So why is it that TSH alone doesn't cut it? I really believe thyroid health is such an important example here. Most doctors only check your TSH, which is the pituitary hormone in your brain that tells your thyroid to work. But that's like checking the thermostat without seeing whether the heat is actually turning on. Free T3, free T4, thyroid antibodies give you the real story. This matters especially for women because one in eight of us will develop Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And most don't even know it until they've been dismissed for years with symptoms of low thyroid, like fatigue, weight gain, or hair loss. 13% of us have antibodies against the thyroid gland. So please check yourself. The third scenario is which tests can be truly preventative or accurate in predicting your future health or disease risk. Most lab work is about what's already wrong. But what if you want to know what's brewing under the surface? What might put you at risk for heart disease, diabetes, or accelerated aging? That's where preventive markers come in. Here, we're talking about high-sensitivity C-reactive protein and lipoprotein little a. So with that in mind, let's talk about what blood markers predict future disease risk? How do I know if I have hidden inflammation? Which tests show early signs of diabetes or heart disease? And what about food sensitivity testing? Think about your home. If the fire alarm goes off, you know you've got a problem. But what if the wiring is smoldering behind the walls? You won't see the flames until it's too late. That's what hidden inflammation is like in your body. It's the smoldering that silently drives heart disease, diabetes, dementia, and accelerated aging. And here's the key. Most standard blood work never checks for it. So what are the tests that actually predict future health? So many patients come to me and say, my labs are fine, but I don't feel fine. And that's because the tests that they've been given are designed to catch disease when it's already burning, not when it's smoldering. And what we want are labs that are predictive, preventive, tests that give us time to put out the fire before it spreads. So how do you know if you've got that smoldering fire, if you have hidden inflammation? One of my favorite tests is high-sensitivity C-reactive protein or HSCRP. It's not glamorous, but it's powerful. If it's elevated, it means your immune system is stuck in fight mode. You might not feel symptoms yet, but it's like smoke rising before you see flames. Elevated HSCRP predicts your risk of heart attacks, stroke, autoimmune disease, and even depression. So to build a clearer picture, I like to put high-sensitivity C-reactive protein together with other markers, including fasting insulin, which tells us how hard your body is working to keep your blood sugar stable, hemoglobin A1c, which shows us the average wear and tear of sugar on your system, like it did in the patient I mentioned earlier. Other tests that I find valuable include lipoprotein little a, a genetic marker of heart disease risk, and even a coronary artery calcium score, essentially a CT scan that reveals if you've got plaque forming. These tests aren't exotic, but they're underused. When you put them together, they're some of the strongest predictors of future health that we have. What about food sensitivity testing? Here, there's a cautionary tale. People often ask me, should I do food sensitivity testing? And here's my take. I think that most commercial food panels are not that valuable. They're expensive, unreliable, and they're often more confusing than clarifying. If HSCRP or other inflammation markers are high, 
I'd rather guide you through a structured elimination diet, like I talk about in the autoimmune cure. And that tells us in real time which foods are triggering the smoke detector in your body. Here's your takeaway. Don't just measure what's broken. Measure what's brewing. High sensitivity C-reactive protein. Lipoprotein little a. Maybe fasting insulin and coronary artery calcium scores. Those are your early warning system. They're the smoke detectors for your body, catching trouble before the fire spreads. And this is where prevention becomes power. If your last lab work didn't include some of these tests that we talked about today, that's your cue to start a conversation. Bring it to your doctor. Ask for more than the basics. You deserve data that actually explains why you feel the way that you do. And stay with me because in future episodes, I'll take you from numbers to action. I'll walk you through the supplements and strategies that I recommend once we have these results in hand. Hit subscribe so you don't miss it because this is where prevention turns into power.